get in. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Merry Christmas. Before we send the pre-K and, uh, and those back, we want to do something. Of course, every week, you know, every month, we have people who are uh, celebrating their birthdays. And of course, it's Jesus' birthday, so we got to celebrate his birthday, right? Happy All birthday. right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have these guys pass out some, uh, some little candles. And so if you grab them, don't put it on. Don't put it on yet. Just hold on to it. And I'm going to have Howie come up here. And he's going to lead us to sing happy birthday to Jesus. So once everyone have one, say, I got one. I, I, I. All right. We all ready? So here's what we're going to do first. We're going to turn off the lights. Turn it all off. All of them. All of it. Turn it off. Turn off your lights. Turn off all your lights. No candles. Turn it off. All right. Turn off your candles. Now we're going to turn it all on at the same time. One, two, three. All right. Hold it up. And now we're going to sing happy birthday to Jesus. Go ahead, Howie. You got to get plugged in? I think so. I think we're ready to go. You need some light? Maybe. <laughs> I need more light, guys. No, we're good. <laughs> we're going to sing it in the, in the traditional sense, and then we're going to sing it as we always do when, whenever it's um, another brother or sister's in this fellowship's birthday also. So uh, we'll sing it a few times. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Let's do it again. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I think we can put on the lights now. <laughs> All right, we're going to dismiss the kids, the pre-K and the K and pre-K. And by the way, um, if you guys will return these, the guys will pick them up. So pre-K and K, you go to the back. All of the other kids, except those who will be participating in the play, will be in here with us. So everyone, uh, all ready for Christmas? You, you finished shopping or are you going to run out to the mall today? And everyone is done. Uh, you might not have been done. You, you missed someone. You missed me. Uh, did you buy anything for me? I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> Was that? Same thing as last year. Same thing color. as, okay, a different color, all right. <laughs> this morning we're going to do a short study. Am I going in and out again? Okay, all right, just want to make sure. We're going to do a short study, as Victor shared, that we're going to do a little, uh, we have a little something extra for this morning uh, time in, in God's Word. Um, but this morning, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Of course, every year we talk about the Christmas story, Jesus in the manger. You know, it always is a challenge looking at this, this, this story, this historical event, and find something new, find something that will just grab our attention and speak to us. And I believe the Lord will speak to us through his word as he always does. But let's pray before we open his word. Father, we thank you that you have sent your son to be one of us, to put on this, this outfit, this flesh that is prone to, to being hurt 
to poverty, to all of the things that we can experience in this life. And you, you sent your son. Father, we know that your plan for us, well, is to give us a hope and a future. And we have that in this little babe we call Christ, our Savior. Father, I pray that everyone here, Lord, that we will see him and know him and desire to know him even more as we consider who he is, our Savior, our Messiah. Father, I pray that you bless our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each Gospel writer, they approach who this Christ is. They look at him in four different ways. When we look at Matthew, well, Matthew looks at Christ as the Messiah, the King, which I want to speak to us to mo this morning about. But Mark, he looks at Christ as the suffering Savior. We know how, how Jesus died on the cross, and Mark looked through his life and saw his suffering and highlights that. But third, he looked at uh, Luke, looks at him as a man, 100% man, of course. We know, we know Jesus came in his humanity that he may understand our suffering and understand what we go through. And of course, John, he looks at Christ as God in flesh, 100% God in human flesh. Now, Matthew, he took the approach of proving that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we read, Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he taught about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, so all that this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, if you pause right there, Matthew, again, he, his approach to Jesus is to prove that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. Why is this important? You see, Matthew, being a, a Hebrew, a Jewish man, he looked at his Jewish audience, and he knew the importance of saying, listen, this Jesus, well, he is who the Old Testament said that he is. You see, long before Jesus was born, the 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 Bible prophesied and said that Messiah will be born. And it speaks about a number of things which we will go over in a few. But prophecy, he uses prophecy. Notice he said this, is, this might be fulfilled, that, this is, that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken. Matthew wants to go to the Old Testament and point to all of the scriptures that point to that Jesus is Messiah. Now, I want to side take a sidetrack here to come back to prophecy, but I want you to see the importance of prophecy. Now, consider with me, I, as I was driving, uh, we were going downtown yesterday, I saw a billboard and it said $300 million. That's the mega ball. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the jackpot, that which I know today, and, and people are going to buy the, that lotto ticket and put it in a stocking so that when their loved ones open it up, they will say, wow, I have a chance 
of winning the lottery. I have a chance. A chance? Yes. Do you know what the odds are for winning the lottery? Listen, the odds are 1 in 292.2 million. 1 in 292, excuse me, yes, 292.2 million. That's your chance. And, and mathematicians will, will tell you, you have a better chance of being struck by a lightning, being uh, given birth to uh, quadruplets, identical quadruplets, uh, uh, being hit by a meteor, <laughs> and being eaten by a shark all on the same day. <laughs> That's what they say. I didn't make it up. You have a better chance of, of, of doing all those things than winning the lottery. But yet, people line up. Man, I got to get my number, you know? But here's the deal. The chances of you winning the lottery, the chances of Jesus being who the scripture says he is, man, listen to this. There's 200, excuse me, 1,800 plus prophecies in the entire Bible. 1,800. That's 25% of the entire Bible is dedicated to prophecy. You look at the book of Revelation, it's all pro prophetic, it's all speaking of the future. And that's what prophecy is, it's being able to give a, a prediction of things that will happen in the future to the pinpoint, you know, where there's no room for error. If there's one prophecy wrong, listen, you throw out that entire book because it's, it's wrong. God's word says that his prophecy will be 100%. And so when you look at the scriptures again, uh, two, uh, 25 percent of them are all prophecy, dedicated to prophecy. But listen, 300 or so, a little bit more than 300 of prophecies deal with just the birth, the life and the death of Jesus Christ. 300. Now if you consider this, that the odds of one person, fulfilling just eight of those prophecies is one, listen, one to the 17th power. Or if you want it in this way, 100 uh, uh, quadrillion, 100 quadrillion. If you take a million dollars uh, and you give away a million dollars every year from the day that Jesus was born till now, you probably have about two billion. And yet it's four times the amount the odds of Jesus fulfilling or any one man fulfilling just eight. Now, if you add it up, if you, uh, you know, again, a mathematician said the chances or the odds of one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies will be like filling the, st the state of Texas. I don't know how many of you have drove across Texas. It's a long state. It's a dry state. You know, it's like, is there anything but road around here? And yet, the mathematician says, if you fill that state with coins, silver coins, two feet tall, and you take a man, blindfold him, put him on a helicopter, and drop him in the middle of the state, and he reaches down and grab that one coin that was marked by you, that's the chances of, of one person fulfilling eight of the prophecies. And yet, Jesus, not... Not eight, not 48. If you take just 48, this is one to the 50, 157 or 158, uh, you know, chances of, uh, uh, of, of him fulfilling the prophecy. That's, that's a one with 158 zeros behind it. It's from that, just for 48, you say that's impossible. But listen, Jesus fulfilled 300 of the prophecies. Now, what are those prophecies? Listen, I'll go through them really quick. First of all, that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. That Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. You don't think about it, but the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter, two, chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Oh, you, uh, but you, O Bethlehem, or Ephrathah, are, uh, are only a small village in Judah, yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from, from the distant past. You see, Micah wrote this, listen, 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years. You think about it, how, what will you be doing next year? What would you be? 
You can't even think about what you will be doing tomorrow. Well, maybe opening some gift. That's, but that's as far as you can go. But to write something 700 years in a distant future about someone you don't know that uh, anything, he, he, he was able to pinpoint accuracy, uh, predict that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. What are the chances of that? Not only that he will be born in Bethlehem, but it was also predicted and prophesied that he was be, who be born of a virgin. Did you see what we read in, uh, in chapter 1 of Matthew? That behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. Now, how many of you have a virgin mother? <laughs> that in itself is impossible. How in the world can someone give birth if she haven't been with a man? But yet, the, the writer uh, of uh, Isaiah looks in, into the future, uh, again, another 700 years, and predict that Jesus will be born of a virgin. But thirdly, that he will be visited by kings. We all know the three wise men. They weren't really three, but we, you know, this, it makes for a good story. But you see, Jesus was visited by wise men from the east. And what did they do? They came and they brought uh, gifts they brought gifts that's fitting for a king, and they worshipped him. Again, the scripture tells us, and this was a thousand years before Jesus was even born, that, that kings will come and they will worship him, bearing gifts. And we know that Jesus fulfilled that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, not only that, but we are told that when Jesus was born, that there will be a massacre, that the children around in his city, in Bethlehem, will be killed. And in Jeremiah, written 600 years before Christ, Jeremiah 31, verse 15, it says, and Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. What is that? You see, when Jesus was born, we have... Uh, a king, Herod, he, he's threatened by this little babe. He is afraid that Jesus will take his throne. And so what did he do? He sent the troops in and killed some estimate 30 to 40 children. Could you imagine a small little town, Bethlehem, maybe a, a thousand, two thousand people living there. Everyone probably knows each other. And now all of the children there under two years old are gone. How devastating. But yet the Bible prophesied that this will happen. We also see, number five, that he was taken to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod. Again, another 700 years before Christ, Hosea tells us that Jesus will come out of Egypt. Why? Again, when Herod came to kill Jesus, uh, his mother and his father was warned in a dream to go down to Egypt to hide for a few years. Then when Herod was dead, of course, they came back and moved to Nazareth. But number six, the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. Listen, this was predicted 2,000 years before Jesus was come. If you think about it, Jesus came through the tribe of, uh, excuse me, through Abraham. You know, Abraham, of course, lived 2,000 years before Christ. He had Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. One of the sons was Judah. And the scripture predicted that Jesus will come through the line of Judah. And Jesus fulfilled that in the Gospels. But, uh, but number uh, seven, that he will be the, a descendant of David. I mentioned that, well, Judah had, uh, of course, children. And, and his great-great-grandson uh, also uh, was in that line. And then Jesus came to David, through the line of David, uh, so that he could be king. Listen, again, another uh, thousand years before Christ. And Jesus fulfilled that. And lastly, he will be called Emmanuel. He will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. What do we call Jesus? Well, he is God in the flesh. Uh, John uh, chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He became one of us. He put on flesh. He is God with us. He's Listen, Jesus fulfilled, these are just eight 
of the 300 plus prophecies concerning Jesus. Why is this so important? Again, because if Jesus uh, was predicted in the past, what, how he, where he will be born, what he will be called, uh, all of those things, listen, it also speaks of his death. It predicted that he, you know, first of all, the Bible tells us that he will come in on a donkey. Did not Jesus come in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, which, uh, you know, he came in and everyone was saying, Hosanna in the highest. That was predicted in the Old Testament. Not only did he come in on a donkey, but we know that he was betrayed by Judas. The Bible tells us in, the, in Psalm 41, verse 9, that Jesus would be betrayed. Again, a thousand years predicting that he will be betrayed. Not only just be betrayed, but specifically that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And Jesus, of course, fulfilled that. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver also that he would, be, he would die a sacrificial death. You know, Jesus, no one took Jesus' life from him. He, he said to himself, I laid down my life. I lay it down, and I will take it up again. See, Jesus sacrificed himself. Why? Because we are sinners, and we need a Savior. But also, we know that the Scripture predicted that he will die a criminal death. If, if you think about the death of Christ, uh, an innocent man did absolutely nothing wrong. The perfect, most perfect man that ever walked the earth, and yet he was brutally beaten and nailed to a cross. And on the side of him, well, we know, know that it was two thieves that was also crucified with him. The Bible the, the, the predicted that he will die with criminals, but also lastly, which is probably the most important that he was raised from the dead. If you go around and look at all of the tombs of all of the religious people of this world, the religious leaders and gurus, you can find where their grave is. If you go over to Israel, there's a tomb that's marked, but, it's not, but Jesus' body is not there. It is empty, because why? He is risen. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, we of all men have uh, are to be most pitied. We have no hope. That means all that we have done, all the life that we have lived, we lived in vain. And if you think about it, all of the scriptures and all of the prophecies, yes, we can have all these prophecies as fulfilled, but if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, it's all in vain. It's a waste. And so Jesus was raised from the dead, fulfilling the prophecies. Now, if anyone is not convinced, of course, after these prophecies are fulfilled, uh, listen, if nothing, if these doesn't convince you, nothing will. Think about it. If you think about all of the skeptics in the world and you bring and present to them all of the prophecies that was fulfilled, which is just impossible to happen, but yet Jesus fulfilled them and people will still look on and say, ah, I'm still not convinced. How could you? not be convinced. Listen, we went through just a handful of prophecies, and I want us to think about what Matthew is trying to convince, convey to us, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. He came to save, us, save his people from their sins. What sins? Listen, again, we all are sinners, and we need a Savior. It doesn't matter how good you think you are, you're not good unless you're perfect. And there's only one that's perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. And so the Lord came, uh, he gave, and he fulfilled all of these prophecies so that we can know that what he says, well, he will do. What did he say? Well, if you think about it, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that all of, the prof all of the promises in Christ are yes and amen. All of the promises in Christ are yes and amen. What does that mean? Well, you see, Jesus makes 
promises and God makes promises to us. And he gave us these prophecies so that we can say if God was, uh, was dead on on his word, if he kept his promises, if he kept the, the prophecies, then we can, we can be sure that based on his past, we can be sure that what he said he will do in the future, he will do. And so what is his promises to us? Listen, just a few. God promised that all things work together for the good, for those who love him. All things. You see, you may be going through a really difficult time in your life, and you're asking, why, God? Why? Why are you allowing this to happen? Listen, be calm. Relax. Why? God is going to work it out for your good. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know, uh, you know, what he will do to get it accomplished, but he will. He will work it out together for your good. Not only that his promise, uh, he's going to work it out, but also he promised to comfort us. And if you have ever lost a loved one, if you have ever gone through a difficult time, God is there saying, I'm going to comfort you. And he comforts us so that we can, in turn, comfort someone who have gone through the exact same thing or something similar to what we have gone through, but God promised that he will comfort you. I love the word that Jesus said. He said this, I will never leave you or forsake you. You see, sometimes you may feel, well, where is God? Why am I not sensing him? Listen, you don't have to sense him. You don't have to feel him. You have to know that his word says he will never leave you or forsake you. You may not see him, but he's right there. He's there to comfort you. But thirdly, God promised to finish the work he began in your life. The work that he started, and this is so important because some of you may have started walking with the Lord. And you have fallen off. You have, you have gone astray. And, and, and maybe this is the first time you've been in church in a long time. And, and, and you're saying, man, can I, can I get back up? Listen, Jesus said, God says, the work I began, the moment that he called you into this faith relationship with him, even though you fall, he, he promised that he will complete that work. Do you understand? There's three it, it, there's three uh, areas of our lives when it comes to salvation. There's, there's uh, salvation, there's sanctification, and there's glorification. Glorification is the day that we will become perfect just like Jesus Christ. Right now we're being sanctified, we're being changed, we're being, he, he's working his work in us. But there will be a time when we are perfect. When will that be? Well, I believe that's when Jesus comes and he takes us home and we'll be perfect. So, he will complete the work that he began. That's his promise. But also, he promised to supply all of our needs. Now, I want to be clear. He said, Matthew chapter 6, 33, that God will give, uh, supply all of our needs, right? And notice he said he will supply all of our needs, not all of our wants. Because some of us have big Christmas lists. Lord, ha, <laughs> ha. I want the car, you know, the Bentley, you know, that would be nice because everyone needs to know. He will supply our needs. You have food, you have shelter, you have clothing. Listen, yesterday I went down with, the, with a couple of people downtown, and I was humbled by how many homeless people were down there. I, I was really humbled, and I, I was just taken back, and, and, and I... You know, I, I allowed them to do all the ministry. I just, I was being ministered to. But I, I just look at how much I have. And sometimes, you know, we complain. We open the fridge and say, there's nothing in there. We go in our closet and we say, oh, we have nothing to wear, you know. But listen, God supplies all of our needs. And even as I sat down to one gentleman, his name, TJ, and I just talked with him, homeless, and he said, you know what? We are being taken care of down here. I just thought this was amazing. Here is someone who was sleeping on the street, and, and when he talked to a, another guy was passing by, hey, brother, how you doing? Man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed? Yes, you see, even being homeless, they're being given clothing. Some of them have better outfits than me. They, they have, I mean, people are out there blessing them. God promised that he will always provide what you need. Not necessarily what you want, but he will provide what you need. 
And so his promises are true. And listen, he also promised to give us rest. Rest for our soul. You see, some of us are restless and we're wondering, oh, what will I do? What, what will happen to me when I die? The, Jesus answers that question. You give your life to him and you don't have to worry about where you're going to end up. I'm going to heaven. How many of you are going to heaven? And, and it's not based on, on what you have done or what, how good or bad you are. It's based on the work that God has done. And so therefore he gives us rest for our soul. I don't have to wrestle with my eternity. That's been settled on the cross and then he also, listen, he promised the abundant life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You know, if you're looking at your life and, and wondering, you know, what's going on in my life? Listen, have you surrendered your life to him? He wants to give you life more abundantly. And, and then lastly, uh, he promised to give us uh, salvation. God said, that through Jesus Christ, if you believe on the Son, if you believe that, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You say, saved from what? Remember what Matthew said? He will save us from our sins. You know, when, when you look at our sins, when you commit a crime, you stand before a judge, the judge is going to con convict you of your sin and sentence you to whatever time the law requires that you pay your penalty. In the same way, the Bible says the penalty of the payment for sin is death. When we sin, that's our payment, death. But yet, through Jesus Christ, we have life. I said lastly, but I'll put one more. Jesus promised that he will return again. Jesus promised that he will return again. People will say, oh, but it's been 2,000 years. Listen, it was 2,000 years when God promised that the Messiah will come. And he kept his word. So will he come? Absolutely. We can trust that because of his faithfulness in the past, he will be faithful in the future. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we just look at these prophecies and your faithfulness, we know that your word... Well, it can be relied upon. It's, it's, it's trustworthy. And just have you, as you have promised in the past, Lord, you have also promised in the future. And I know some of us are going through difficult times, but Lord, help us to hold on to your word. Some of us have lost hope, but Lord, help us to hold on to your word. Some of us are struggling. We're in pain. Lord, help us to hold on to your word. And it is, is filled with promises, and your promises are true. Father, I pray that as we now look at this presentation, that the words that are shared, the things that are going to be shared, Lord, it will minister to our hearts, that we will let down our guards, and Lord, that we'll hear your voice as you speak. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.